Uh, we have got a little bit to do today. It has to do with the lab, the first lab. Uh, and then we'll start, if we look at what's coming up, um, the moments of inertia, or actually tomorrow, we'll actually start that today. Um, I don't know how much of it we'll do, but we'll do some of it today. And then quiz three opens. Actually, it's probably already open. I need to check on the date on that, I suppose. Uh, let's see. Quiz three. Yeah, it's just... That's probably not quite the right due date for it, though. I'd like it to stay open longer than that. Uh, let's let's see if we can change that. Let's see. Yeah, we want it to end. Today's the 10th, so the 17th. Or actually, it'll open on the 11th. But you can go ahead and work on it. Um, so quiz three. I mean, it does have, I think it does two attempts that, uh, before it closes on you. And um, it'll be content that we've covered, so you could go ahead and do it at some point soon if you wanted to. Uh, we've got exam uh, two coming up on the 24th. Uh, the drop day is that, 20, that Friday, the 26th. Uh, we actually have the 25th, the day after the exam, as just a lab day. Um, you'll have... Uh, two labs. Actually, one of the labs will be due before then, but you have the second lab uh, that you could use that day to, to do the lab, um, and you'll get your grades for the exam two back probably on the 25th, maybe the morning of the 26th. Make sure that uh, you want to stay in the class or not. Um, remember that you can retake either a version of exam one or a version of exam two that shows up down here on August the 12th. Yeah, August the 12th, exam one or two do-over. Uh, so you can do that if you want to. Um, you just have to decide that after the drop date's the only thing. So I think we've got, uh, yeah, that's going. The first thing I want to do, actually there was a question Actually, we'll save that a question. Let's look at the lab first. So lab one is uh, set up for, talk about lab one, I don't know why it's in blue. Lab one is uh, a tensile test lab. So later on in the quarter, you're going to get in groups, three, four people in a team, something like that. And you're going to design and build and test a little wooden truss. And wooden uh, meaning it's made out of laser cut, um, kind of like masonite uh, material. I have some up here for your samples. So it's this, this kind of material. It's eight, eighth inch thick and a manufactured type material, mainly so that it's not actual plywood or something. It has a grain in multiple directions or whatever, or lumber that has a grain in one direction. Because um, that does affect the strength of the material if it has one direction it's strong in, another direction it's not as strong in. Um, so this one's more or less uniform, uh, but we don't know really how strong it is at all. And so lab one goes through the process of you running a tensile test on these little specimens that I cut out on the laser and uh, determine what's the ultimate strength. That's the main thing for what we're going to do is... Uh, the main objective is find sigma u, ultimate strength for, um, I think if you were to go to Lowe's and buy this material, it's called tempered hardboard, or hard, yeah, tempered hardboard, maybe is what they call it. I don't think it's hardwood, hardboard. Uh, our samples and their truss are eighth inch thick. Or at least that's a nominal thick. You'd have to measure it to see how thick it is. Um, more or less an eighth inch thick. So 0 0.125 inches. And again, it might have some variance. It might be 0 0.13 in some places, 0 0.17 in another place. I don't know. But um, more or less, they're an eighth, eighth inch thick. And you're going to get a section of this, like a two foot by two foot section of this that you have to... Go into SolidWorks and lay out all of the pieces you want to cut. This is at the end of the quarter. Uh, all of the pieces you want to cut uh, to assemble your truss from. And you'll get more information. I don't actually start that part of the project until after the drop date in case, you know, you form a team and then 
two of your team members drop and it's just you. So um, that happens every now and then. So we won't actually start the trust part, you know, the design part of this project until the Monday after the uh, drop in. Um, this part, though, is kind of even outside of the trust project. It's still an interesting thing. It's a version of what would really happen if you were trying to figure out what uh, material properties you're dealing with. So what we looked at, I don't know, it was like on the second day of class or something, was generating this kind of plot where we had something like this. And we could get some data off of here. You know, we could, this is the thing that we're going to look for. Sigma U, the ultimate strength. But there was also other information um, like over here maybe was the yield strength. Um, we had the slope of this part of the line being the modulus of elasticity. And so we could get a lot of different data. Now this particular graph I drew would be for a very ductile material. The stuff you're using for the trust and, and for lab one and lab two uh, it's not really all that ductile, you know, it's a wood-based material, engineered material, so it's not going to uh, have quite the ductility. So, in other words, the curved part of the graph is not going to be very evident. In fact, we're, we're only going to collect one data point. To get this amount of data, you would have to have all of the data points to generate this plot, right? You'd have to collect data all through here, um, which is possible to do, um, but we're not going to do that part. We're only going to collect this point. So where did it break at? Well, not even that point, really. Technically, I guess we're going to collect this point, you know, the fracture point. So the way the machine works is um, you load your sample in there. You uh, set the rate that this machine is going to uh, pull on your sample, and then it records the force and how far it has moved, um, it doesn't record those, it displays those. Um, if you had software connected to it, then yes, it could collect all that data, but we're not doing this collection part. Um, basically, you tell it to pull on this thing at a certain rate until you tell it to stop. Uh, and you tell it to stop after it breaks, obviously. And um, it will display the last or the highest, the peak value of force that it uh, experienced. So you'll grab basically the force associated with this data point. Um, you won't necessarily have the strain at that point. Uh, you could kind of get that also um, if you set the machine correctly. Um, we're not going to bother with that. We're just going to get the force at fracture. Um, and there's a whole, let's see, there's a whole, no, not in web work. Where's, where's our, can I close it? Oh, it isn't here though. There's a whole document, but it's on today's class, July 10th. There's a document here, Lab 1 Instructions. So this PDF will kind of walk you through all the different stuff. Um, here's the general shape. Now, yours actually have holes. Oh, those are really big. Let's make it a little thinner. Yours has mounting holes on either end also. Uh, and these are where you can basically um, screw the sample into the testing fixture uh, with the, the bolts that are provided up in the room where you'll test this. This is this room is Bogard um, 305 is where this machine is. And so you'll be able to go up there. Um, that room should be generally open most of the eight to five times. You know, there's, there's, I don't believe any classes at all in there during the summer. Um, and so you should be able to go in there. If it's locked, then get one of us, somebody to unlock it because there's no reason for it to be locked. Um, and follow this procedure that's laid out here. But basically, um, your test sample looks something like that. You bolt it in the machine. This is the machine, right? Here, the Tinius Olsen, uh, I don't remember the exact number for it, HK, uh, H25KS. So the H is the H shape, you know, uh, that the, the little horizontal piece there is really dark on your screen. Uh, the horizontal piece there moves up and down, and the two vertical uprights are, 
are stationary. So they just stay there and this horizontal piece moves up and down. And you tell the machine using a little control panel over here, basically which direction to move up or down and how fast to move. Um, and the 25K is that in, well, let's see, I don't know if it's, you can really see, I, I can barely see it on this one, so I assume you can't really see it there at all. But right in here, there's a load cell. Uh, and a load cell is a um, mechanical device that uh, measures, well, uh, when it's connected to the computer, it measures strain. And um, it can, if you know the material and the shape of the load cell, and you know the strain in the load cell, then you can back out what force must have created that amount of strain. Um, Remember, strain is just change in length over original length. And so if you know what it would have taken to produce a certain amount of strain, then you can calculate the force. And that's what it does. It backs out what force must be applied if I'm experiencing this amount of strain. Uh, and so it does that. And so it will record in a display on this little screen over here the, uh, the force that it's measuring. It'll also display the, the delta, so how far has this moved from one point to another. Um, and so you'll know, uh, you could calculate the, uh, the change in length of your test sample also, um, but we're, again, not really worried about that. We just want to know the maximum force experienced by this test sample uh, before it broke. And then once we know that and the dimensions of the sample, then you'll be able to calculate, if you know force, dimensions of the sample, you have the area of the sample, force divided by area is the stress. If you know the maximum force that it took, then you knew the maximum stress that this sample experienced before it broke, and that is the ultimate strength of it. And if we do that often enough, you know, there's, I don't know, like a hundred samples over here. So there's, um, there's probably on campus, there's 40-ish students, so we'll have 40 samples of data plus in, in here, uh, there's, you know, some back data from years previous that if we want to supplement uh, to get a even more larger or a larger sample size, then there's more samples in here that uh, we can pull from if you want to. Um, so let's go back to the handout here. So this little button is important. Actually, those two buttons are important. The one on the right hand side is the power. So the zero and one are the open and close version of the switch that just turns it on. Sometimes it won't come on. Uh, so there's, you know, three kind of reasons it won't come on. One of them is it's just not plugged in because it just, somebody didn't plug it. So check, make sure it's plugged in. Um, more common than that uh, is the, this red button is the e-stop or the emergency stop. And if someone has pushed it, then it stays pushed down. So maybe something happened or maybe somebody turned it off by pushing the e-stop for some reason. Um, but if this thing is pushed in, then um, the machine won't come on because it thinks it's in an emergency shutdown mode, so it won't come on. So to remove the uh, emergency shutdown mode, it's got these arrows on it. You just twist the red knob and those arrows and it'll pop back up. And underneath it, it'll expose a little green ring of uh, just color. It's not a light or anything, just color green ring around the base of the um, e-stop button. And uh, that'll tell you that it's in uh, ready to operate mode again. The other reason is harder to discern, and I don't know if, know if you can really see it, but it, but this line right here, it's a metal rod that runs up and down the length of the machine, and on, well, you can kind of see there's a little stop, there's a little stop, and then there's a corresponding little notch on this guy. Well, it's kind of like, not a notch, but it's a uh, overhanging piece of metal. And if any of those are making contact, basically it's kind of like a, a limit switch if it reaches the top or bottom. And sometimes it just will touch the, this piece will touch this piece sometimes and they make electrical contact. And it also says, hey, something's out of whack. It's out of position or whatever. So most of the time, the only thing you have to do is kind of like just move the rod around a little bit so that it's not um, making contact with with this piece over here, getting really cluttery. Um, and uh, it's just jiggle it and it'll go. If it's if this is the problem, it's usually beeping. So it might come on, but it's beeping. It won't let you do anything. 
Um, also, if it's ran all the way to the bottom or all the way to the top, then it'll also do that kind of thing uh, because it doesn't want you to accidentally try to overrun it up or down. Um, so if it's beeping, then that's probably the problem. Um, this is kind of a picture of the panel. So right here in this area, you've got the force. That's what it's currently reading. It'll rarely ever go to zero, like 0, 0.000. Um, it'll usually get to like 0 0.02 or 002 or something like that. It, it usually doesn't actually read zero, um, <clears throat> even when there's no force apparently applied to it. So um, what you do, though, is this button right here is the zero force button. So uh, you get the machine set up the way you want it. You push this button and it'll zero it out. Again, it won't read necessarily all the way to zero, but it'll read really close to zero. And um, that way, it doesn't have any preload on it or anything. So it doesn't. It, it kind of erased all of the uh, memory that the previous test, whatever it was, whatever it happened to be, um, had in the machine. Um, this number beneath it, this this number, that is the. I think it used the word extension. Maybe I don't remember what it labels it as. But it's basically how far has the crosshead, that horizontal piece, moved up or down since it was last zeroed. This button zeroes that number out too. You don't have to really worry with it though. Um, over here, you got the up triangle. That moves the crosshead up. This one moves it down. All this text over here kind of explains all this too. Um, the right here in this window, there are um, two speeds, speed one and speed two. One of them, speed one, should be one inch per minute, so really slow. Maybe it's two, it's, it should be a slow speed. Um, basically, that's how fast is the machine gonna move while you're testing. So you want that to be a pretty slow, you don't wanna you know, just um, accelerate really quickly and break the piece that you're sampling. You wanna apply the load pretty slowly, so about an inch per minute. The other one, speed two, I think is what they label it here. Um, that's how fast does this machine move when it's in jog mode. I think that's, they call it speed two, probably on here. Um, and in this one, this is where you're trying to set the machine up. So it, maybe the, somebody ran the crosshead all the way to the top and you got to bring it back down. If you had to do that one inch per minute, that'd be a long time to do um, because it could be, you know, 20 or 30 minutes, uh, 30 inches up there. And so you know, take half an hour to move it down. Um, so the other mode should be something like 30 inches per minute, 20 inches per minute, a big number. Um, you can, if any of these numbers are not set right, there is a menu button, um, I think it's this one, that uh, you can go and change the speeds if you want to. Um, in that menu button, you can also change if it's measuring in newtons or pounds. Um, I don't think it matters whichever unit system well, it might kind of matter. I will look at the where you're going to collect the data in a minute, and it might already be set up to put it in one unit or another. Um, anyway, so you might um, want it to, to change these speeds. Speed one should be about one inch per minute. Speed two should be about 20 or 30 inches per minute. Um, how you switch between the two speeds is with this button. So there's this little red LED, and that's what's trying to be described over here. So the LED indicates the machine is in, or well, a solid LED, if I read all the sentence, uh, indicates, so one that's just constant on, indicates that the machine is in continuous mode. So that's the slow speed, speed one. If you push the circle button again, then the LED will start flashing, and you're in jog mode, and uh, it will run at speed two. The, all, the other difference is speed one, when you push up, it keeps going up until you stop it. It doesn't actually stop. It just keeps moving at one inch per minute up until you tell it to stop. Um, the jog mode, so pushing the button and making the LED flash, um, it only moves when you hold down one of the upper down triangle buttons. So once you let go of the button, it stops moving. Because you, you wouldn't want the machine to suddenly take off 30 inches per minute up or down, so um, it only uses speed two while you're holding the button down. 
Um, so I would recommend, you know, trying to, before you put your test sample in the machine, trying to make sure you know how the, to move the crosshead up and down. Um, let's see what other pictures do we have here. That's the general procedure. That's what you're going to write. So um, the general procedure is you're going to take your test specimen, bolt it in the machine. I think it's obvious how it goes in there. Um, surely it's pretty, uh, there's two holes and there's two bolts. So I think you can figure it out. Um, go into the continuous mode. Um, this is uh, after you've got it lined up. So you probably had to jog the, the crosshead kind of close to where you needed it to be. Um, to get your sample in there, because it's not a whole lot of slack. You know, sample is not going to stretch any, and the, the the little fixtures that hold the sample aren't going to move around a whole lot. So you got to get it pretty close. Bolt the sample in. Just make sure you're in continuous mode, so that's the solid LED, not blinking. Uh, zero out the force by pushing the F1 button, so that it'll reach zero force. So you're starting with zero force applied to your sample. Oh, this part is important. Peak hold um, can be on or off, and this is set in that menu. It should be on, but somebody could have turned it off because other people use the machine from time to time. But um, what this does is if peak hold is not on, then you'll run your test. It will go up, The force will go up to some number and then the thing will break and there's no force on there until it goes back to zero or really low, close to zero. Um, and it didn't, unless you were looking at the readout at the moment that it broke, then you wouldn't see how much force it actually took to break the sample. But if you put peak hold on, what it does is the peak force experienced by the sample during the test stays on the screen. So it just always shows you the maximum force it experienced. So peak hold needs to be on so that you actually can see the force that your sample experienced before it broke. Um, then you push the up button. Uh, you don't have to hold it down. You just push the up button and that'll start the crosshead moving up. If speed one is set really, really slow, like less than an inch per minute, the machine will probably beep um, to tell you it's moving because it's really hard to see it moving. Um, I think at one inch per minute, it doesn't beep. It just, you can actually see it moving. Um, once it fractures, you push that circle button, the button between the two up and down buttons. Uh, that'll stop the machine. Um, and then you record like on a piece of paper or whatever, the force that it took to break your sample. Then you go over to um, upload your lab one data here and you put that into a little database. There's no entries in there right now, so we would have to add one. And you would add the sample width, the thickness and the load, and it does give you units, so it wants inches and pounds. So if for some reason you collect the data in Newtons, you do need to put it over into pounds into uh, the little sample thing. Each person will do one sample. And um, it's possible that four different things happened. So it should be that it was a tensile failure. That's what we expect to happen. And the, that means that this data that you enter is valid. Um, it's possible though that you push the wrong button and it you know, you crush the thing or whatever. It broke that uh, in compression. You click compression. That way, every, anybody that downloads this, this data, they know that that little piece of information is not something to include in the whole data set. Um, it's possible that one of the holes could have a uh, tear out, torn out, a shear failure. Um, so basically, it didn't break somewhere in the middle of the sample. It broke around the hole somewhere where it was bolted into the machine. Um, that really only ever happens on the really wide samples. You're all going to get kind of a random selection of widths for these samples. That's why it asks you to put the width in. Um, and so that marks that, yeah, I did the lab, but it didn't fail in tension. So don't include this set of data in the bigger set to calculate. And then there's always the other, you know, I don't know, something else happened other than those three things. That just is a way that you can put your data in to complete the assignment but don't include that data in the um, data set. Uh, so this width and thickness, that is, uh, let's go back to here. Here, this is the width. So you will get various different widths. I think there's three or four different widths and yours obviously could be a little bit different. They were all cut on a laser. 
uh, that is pretty accurate, but the, your, yours could have been a little bit smaller or wider than somebody else's. So you measure that, get your calipers out, look at a ruler, get your calipers and measure that um, as accurately as you can. Maybe measure it in a couple of places before you test the thing, because, you know, even this material, it's possible that it uh, stretches and uh, gets thin. So before you test it, measure maybe here, here, and here, and average those three things together. Um, we're not interested in, you know, over here. It shouldn't break there. The tear out, you know, would be something like this, where it tears out over there. Um, again, we're not interested in that. Um, the thickness should be 0.125 inches. That's the, in this picture, the depth into the screen. Um, but you'll measure that also. And if yours is a little different, then record that also. So it, it asks you for width, thickness, and then this critical load is the maximum load it took to break the thing. And so you should get numbers like, uh, I don't know, a tenth of an inch, 0.125 inches, and 100 pounds, something like that. It, none of these, some of these are super thin, so they're not going to take much force at all to break. And others are maybe a quarter inch thick, um, and they'll take um, oh, 100 pounds maybe to break. Um, once you've collected all your data, plugged it into here, I guess you uh, save and view. You shouldn't only, should only have to add one. Each person should only have to add one. Um, we'll leave this open for probably a week to give you time to go up there and collect the data and everything. And then I'll close this. Um, once you've put your data in, you can either wait for more data to be collected here and download it. I think I have to download it. I don't know if you can, um, but I'll download it all next week. Um, or you can put your data in and then go grab one of these old data sets and add yours to it. You need 40 ish samples to, to do some of the stuff that the uh, lab report wants you to do. Like it wants you to report these things. So description of the equipment, so model number and all that kind of stuff. Um, the table of the data, uh, ultimate stress. So you're going to average out the ultimate stress. There's going to be a plot in here. Um, there should be mean and standard deviation. All of these things you can just do in Excel. You don't have to go do them by hand. Um, so unless you want to, if you want to average and mean and standard deviation by hand, that's fine. Um, but Excel can do all of these things if you put them into Excel. Um, that'd be fine. Um, histogram, there's a little bit of instructions on making a histogram. I think that set of instructions might be basically building a histogram using a bar chart in Excel. Um, Excel has a built-in function to create histograms also. Um, you usually have to add in the data package for it to work, which you have. It's one of those things that it just doesn't automatically load up every time you start Excel unless you've told it to do that. Um, then you write a little conclusion. This is more in the, let's see, does it actually say a page? This is more like two pages, a page of setup, data, and all that kind of stuff. You might have to attach some appendix for the data, but it's not a long report. It's more like a summary of what's going on. It is individual, though, so you don't do this as a group. You can all go up there at one time if you want to and one after another do the test. I don't care about that. But when you turn the lab in, it's individual. Um, okay. I think that is enough information to get you going if you read the instructions. Um, before you leave class, just come to this box, get one of the pieces, and do the lab with that piece. Some of them are really kind of thin, so if you get one of those thin ones, then uh, don't break it before you test it, because that would probably fall in the other category um, on the data set. Uh, any questions about that? This shouldn't be terribly complicated. This will give us information on the ultimate strength of what the material that we're going to use for the truss later on. So it'll help us in our uh, when we go to predict how the truss that you design fails. It'll be part of that prediction. Um, we'll also do another test, lab two, uh, to figure out the modulus of elasticity. We could have, wherever I drew it, we could have done these together. You know, you could get the modulus of elasticity from this graph. Um, the only deal here is that you have to record the data as you test it. And we're going to do two different labs to get two different P 
pieces of information. So the other layout's going to be different. And it kind of goes along with beams where this one goes along with the axial stress. Um, but we'll get to that one later. Okay. Um, I think that gets us far enough on lab one. Um, the other thing I wanted to do today is start the idea of calculating moments of inertia. So we need the moment of inertia, or we've actually been using the moment of inertia to calcul uh, calculate flexural stress. We, we use this equation, sigma equals negative m times y over i. So there's the moment of inertia. Uh, how we deal, dealt with that up until now was we just knew the beam was a W6 by 60 or whatever, WT6 by 60 or whatever it was. Um, and we looked up the moment of inertia. So it was just already calculated and we just had to go look it up in the chart. Um, but there's other times where we need to calculate the moment of inertia. So um, there are equations similar. Let's see, I think I have them pulled up already. Similar to the centroid equations. So these, these is, this is page 419 if you have your book. Um, this, this sheet, this scan is in the Moodle page also in that resources folder. <clears throat> and so this I in these shapes, this is the moment of inertia. So there's a sector, quarter, semicircle, whole circle, triangle, and a rectangle. Um, and those are the, you know, kind of primitive shapes that you could use in various combinations to create more complex shapes, just like we did with centroids. Um, we just need to know how do you combine them together. So first, let's just start with we're not combining them, we're just using a beam that's a rectangle. So this one has a rectangular cross section and it has a moment of inertia. Well, it has two, right? There's two numbers here. So the difference in these two numbers is they're both moment of inertia, but they're measured at different points. So when we do the sigma equals m times y over i equation, the flexural stress equation, i in that equation is the moment of inertia, so I, about the neutral axis of the cross section. So this one, here's the centroid C, there's the neutral axis right there. And um, you can kind of see, but what is labeled is, let's get rid of that out. Uh, this axis is labeled X. And over here, this is I X. This one is I X prime. So if I want to calculate the moment of inertia about the neutral axis, I need to use X. And all of these are that way. So they all show an X axis and an X prime axis. Actually, this one doesn't. This one only shows X. But um, the others all show X and X prime. There are reasons sometimes where you might want to know the moment of inertia about the bottom or the base of this shape. That's the X prime. So this axis down here is labeled X prime and goes with this equation. Um, unless you're confident that you know what you're doing, I wouldn't use X prime. So um, the biggest thing with X prime is that you cannot apply what's called the parallel axis theorem. Um, well, that doesn't mean anything yet, but later on that will mean something. And um, you can apply the parallel axis theorem to the x, ix, bh cubed over 12 equate, equation. You cannot apply the parallel axis theorem to the x prime. Basically, the parallel axis theorem has already been applied to the x prime axis. Um, so when parallel axis theorem means something, that will make more sense. But uh, for now, just know that unless you know that you are perfectly good with using X prime, don't use X prime, just use the X one. You can always use X, can't always use X prime. All right, so for instance, this kind of works into this problem here. This is one of the web word problems for homework 14. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of a shear and bending diagram problem. It doesn't ask you anything about drawing the shear and bending diagram other than the maximum moment. You know, it asks you 
maximum moment at some point. But um, this part down here, the height of the beam, uh, how this fits into the problem is somewhere in here they have to tell you the, the stress in the beam cannot exceed 197 megapascals. So it doesn't specifically say flexural stress, but it's still um, stress and it applies to the sigma. So you, remember you have sigma equals negative m times y over i. So this sigma maxes out at 195. For me, your numbers might be different, 197 times 10 to the 6 pascals, 197 megapascals. Um, negative m, that's whatever I get right here. So I get that value from there by drawing the shear and bending diagram of the little beam. Um, and then Y and I, I need to draw in a different color, it's hard to see green. Um, y and I are both related to the cross section of the beam. So this one, somewhere in here it has to tell me, um, the beam has a rectangular cross section. So basically if I look at the side of this beam, it's a little rectangle. So if I look at that beam bigger, a rectangle, and I go back to my moments of inertia, this is a rectangle. BH cubed over 12 is I. Oh, it changes per page, all right? Or per app, I guess. Um, no, I was on, I was on here one. All right, so the neutral axis goes right through here. In my chart, that's called the X axis. And I, that's going to go in right here, comes from this. And it is from the, if I go back over here, it's, well, if I go back here, it says B H cubed over 12, and then it's got B and H labeled over here. So B is the base of the rectangle, and H is the height. So B is the base, which... Uh, okay, here it says a thickness of 6.6 .6 centimeters. So this is for me 6.6, .6, and it is centimeters, so I do have to make my units all work out. Remember, a pascal is a newton per meter squared, so I have to convert meters and centimeters somewhere. Um, this distance is height, which I don't know. The whole problem here is asking me what is the height of this beam, what, what does it need, how tall does it need to be to not fail uh, beyond, or at least be able to support 197 megapascals of stress. So how tall does it have to be? I know how wide it is, I don't know how tall it needs to be. So in my equation for I, I would have I equals B H cubed over 12, that comes from the chart here, B H cubed over 12. Um, B is the 6.6, .6 centimeters, H is unknown, I'm solving for it, and then 12. So now I have a variable H in my sigma equation. And then this Y is the distance from the neutral axis to the top or the bottom of the beam. So that would be the negative Y and that would be positive. Uh, since it's a rectangle, it doesn't act, the numbers are the same, they're both one half of h and this is negative one half of h and i don't know if it says anything in here that would make me use one or the other um well it gives it, it doesn't specifically say but it says cannot exceed 197 megapascals uh so in this case it doesn't actually matter i'll assume that this is one of the materials that is the same strength in tension and compression, so it doesn't matter if I put negative one half h or positive one half h in my equation for y. Um, so my equation for sigma would end up looking like 197 times 10 to the 6 pascals equals whatever m ended up being from my chart that I drew times one half h, and it, I could have it as negative one half h or positive one half h over. 6.6 um, .6 centimeters, which I'd have to convert to make sure that my units work out, times h cubed over 12. So the only unknown in there is h. I do know the m max, assuming enough works for the shear and bending diagram. Um, and then I solve for h. 
and that will be the number that goes into the necessary height of the beam blank on the web work problem. <clears throat> so not many of you, I looked and not many have started this one yet. This one, like until you know what moments of inertia or how you could calculate them, then this problem wouldn't make any sense. But um, drawing this shear, you should be able to already get this and this and even these two um, because those are just drawing the shear and bending diagram. But this last blank um, would be uh, dependent on knowing something about how this moment of inertia is calculated. Um, all right, let's go back and let's go back to this. So we could read a moment of inertia of a chart, BH cubed over 12 or whatever. Let's assume that we need to combine two of these things together. So let's make our own T beam. So this is not a standard one that's in a chart somewhere. This is one that we took two pieces of metal and welded together. So let's make them really big pieces of metal just so that we don't have to deal with tiny numbers. Um, one, we'll put all these in inches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's see this one. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we'll make this also one. Okay, so this is our little uh, made up T-beam that we took a seven inch wide, one inch thick, so a pretty massive piece of steel, welded it to a six inch wide by one inch thick, or six inch tall in this orientation by one inch wide or thick um, piece of steel, and we made our own T-beam. So it's, we needed a really big one and we made our own. But now we can't look it up in a chart. It's not a, you know, a W7 by 200 or whatever it ends up weighing, I don't know. But um, there's not one already done. So we have to figure out what is the moment of inertia of this thing and what is where, first of all, where's, where's the neutral axis? We don't even know where the neutral axis is. We know where it should be. It should be somewhere in here, but we don't know exactly where. So. The very first thing we have to do is figure out where the neutral axis is. So we would do that with, we know that uh, it does have symmetry this way. So we can put our Y axis kind of through the center of it and our X axis at the bottom. And this distance would be Y sub C. So the distance to the central uh, centroid, which is where the neutral axis is at for this cross section. So now we're back to just solving a centroid problem. So we do have to remember part one and part two. This is a relatively simple centroid problem, but we still have to remember it. So part one is the flange. Part two on a T-beam, this is called the stem. We need their area. Uh, it's going to be an inches squared. And so it's just seven and six. That's easy enough. Total area of 13 square inches. Um, we don't care about where X is. We've oriented our axis so that it's X centroid is at zero, this coordinate. So we do need Y, the Y sub C for each part in inches. Um, for part one is six plus and half an inch, so 6.5. Part two is three. And then we need to multiply those together. So seven times 6.5 is 45 and a half and 6 times 3 is 18 we need to do the summation of those two it is 63.5 inches cubed and then y sub c is 63.5 inches cubed divided by 13 inches squared and 4.88 inches. So this distance is 4.88 inches. We want this because the moment of inertia that goes into our flexural stress equation is calculated about that axis. That axis is not given on any of our little charts, right? Our chart for rectangles uh, over here 
gives us the moment of inertia about what they have as the x-axis, which is the centroid of the rectangle, not of the T, or it gives us the moment of inertia about the base of the rectangle. Neither one of those axes line up with the neutral axis of the T shape that we built. So here is where, um, since I'm going to have to use what's called the parallel axis theorem, I cannot use X prime equations in that parallel axis theorem. So I have to use this. So let's, let's take this bit of information back over to our problem. So we know that if we have a rectangle and we know where its neutral axis is, labeled X, then we know the moment of inertia about that X axis is for a rectangle base times height cubed over 12. And that just comes from the chart. So basically we just copy this stuff from the chart over here so we don't have to keep flipping back and forth. We do have two rectangles and we know where their centroids are. So the centroid for part one is up here. Centroid for part two is right here. So we know where that is. So that B is cubed over 12 applies at those two red centroids for those two rectangles. We just want to combine them together. So that's where the parallel axis theorem comes in. And basically there are two, you know, here's an axis. So that's the X2 axis, I guess. Here's the X1 axis for part one and part two. And we know the moment of inertia about those axes, but we want to know the moment of inertia about the neutral axis of the whole shape, the T shape. So we have parallel axes. The X1 is parallel to the neutral axis. X2 is parallel to the neutral axis. That's the parallel axis part. And then what it lets us do is it lets us convert the moment of inertia of part one about its own centroid X1 axis to some other remote parallel axis, the neutral axis. And so how we use it, parallel axis theorem is that I about the new axis. So I guess I shouldn't put in a, cause that would also look like the neutral axis, which is where we, in this case, where we want to do, um, there might be instances where you want to translate this to some other axis. So it doesn't, it doesn't only apply to moving the, uh, original axis to the neutral axis. It could work at any other parallel axis, which might be something you want to do just uh, separate from. Um, but the new axis in our case is the neutral axis. It equals the moment of inertia about the old axis, which in our case is going to be what I labeled as X1 or X2. Um, plus the area of the part, so the area of part one or part two times, and here's another y value, y squared. Um, this y here is the distance between the two axes. So x1 to the neutral axis or x2 to the neutral axis, depending on which one you're doing. You have to do this equation once for each part. So we'll have to do it twice because we have two pieces. So for part one, so I1 equals the moment of inertia of part one by its normal, the BH cubed over 12, the base of part one, let's see if I can make them all fit, maybe. Well, it's off the screen, but it was seven seven inches it has a height of one inch we cube that divide by 12 that's the moment of inertia about part one about axis x1 so its own centroid plus the area of part one which is seven inches squared times the distance between these two points so basically times uh this distance that would be Y1. So it'd be, um, if you're looking at the little chart over here that we made, it would be the difference between uh, 6.5 and 
and it doesn't matter positive or negative because you square this term. So it doesn't matter which way you subtract them. But we need 1.62. So this distance oh, is 1.62 inches. And that goes in here. Yeah, uh, I mean, you can put the negative sign in there because it's going to square it, so it won't matter. Um, this is the idea here. If you look at the equation, well, let's do it individually. 7 times 1 cubed over 12. So 7 twelfths. The moment of inertia of the 7 inch by 1 inch flat flange up here by itself is 0 0.583 inches to the fourth. But when I take that same plate, and raise it up above the neutral axis of the composite shape of the T shape, I'm adding uh, 1.62 squared uh, times 7. I'm adding 18.37 inches to the fourth. So the act of moving this flange away from the neutral axis where you know there's no tension or compression so this kind of the center but not the center the centroid of the shape of the t and moving it up above that is greatly increasing the moment of inertia you know it went from 0 0.6 to 18.6 or actually 19 i guess um and if i increase moment of inertia that's in the denominator of my stress equation and I reduced stress. So I had the same shape. I just moved it up away from where the neutral axis is located. And I suddenly have less stress. Um, so this is only part of it, though, because I still also I moved it up by attaching it to part two, the stem. It has a base of one inch and it has a height of six inches. So it's got a larger moment of inertia already. So that number is six cubed, oops, six cubed times one, about about twelve. So it has a moment of inertia of eighteen by itself, um, because it's standing on its end. And this would be easy to think about if you think about a ruler. Like if you, the top part would be a ruler that's laying flat, and you try to bend it, super easy to bend. But if you turn the ruler on its edge and try to bend it that way. You can't really bend it very much at all. It would, if it bends at all, it would just break, usually, um, if it's a wooden ruler. If it's a metal ruler, then who knows what will happen. But um, that's basically what this is. You know, the, the parts are not that different. The top one is a little wider, you know, seven inches versus six inches, but they're more or less the same. And they're drastically different to bend. They have a much different moment of inertia, just turning one horizontal and one vertical. And then, not only that, but I turned the horizontal one that was weak, and I raised it up and increased its uh, resistance to bending. And I still have to add in uh, the fact that I have, I have some distance between the neutral axis of part two and the neutral axis of the T. I have whatever, you know, three and 4.88, the distance in that. So the area is six inches squared. That distance, y2, like I said, was uh, 1.88, so 4.88 minus 3. And I square that term, so I'm going to add in more. 1.88 squared uh, times 6 is 21. So 21.2 inches to the fourth. These were inches to the fourth. So if I add all four of these numbers, so the 18 the 0 0.5, the 18, and the 21, that is the total moment of inertia of the T. So 0 0.583 plus 18.37 plus 18 plus 21.2, 58.153 inches to the fourth. So I went from having a relatively low moment of inertia, just the 0 0.6 inches to the fourth, with this, the flat piece, um, when I add that stem part, it raises up the flat piece and increases its moment of inertia, plus it contributes to the moment of inertia of the stem, which is pretty rigid already, um, and I have suddenly a much, much larger moment of inertia. Um, the, the stem by itself, the 18, 
the one inch base six inch height divided by 12, six inch cube divided by 12, um, is relatively rigid. But the problem with that is um, it wants to buckle. We haven't really talked about buckling, um, but it wants to basically, if you thought about holding a ruler on its edge and trying to bend it, then the chances of it actually bending in the plane that you have it kept in, the 2D plane, are very slim. It wants to go out of that plane. And this flange on top helps keep the stem, the vertical piece, from going out of plane. Um, so it keeps it in that plane. Um, once it goes out of plane, then you have a whole new set of bending things that uh, we're not going to worry with in this course, but do exist. Uh, and uh, we will kind of get into buckling later on when we talk about the truss design because it is a common mode of failure in long, skinny pieces, like pieces that go into a, the truss like you're building. Um, but anyway, this gets us, I think, enough beginning on moment of inertia that um, tomorrow we can come in, do some more moment of inertia calculations um, of more complex shapes, which require us to do centroid and then do the moment of inertia uh, for each part, add them together, parallel axis theorem. And I think we'll be pretty good uh, for a while. So I think we're good for today.